Well, good morning and welcome to worship here at St. Andrews by the Sea and to Palm Sunday, the, the week before Easter. It's uh, our first Palm Sunday together, and as you can see, we have palms, so we are all set. Uh, and I like to begin the Palm Sunday service by actually reading the Palm Sunday scripture. And so as we prepare to celebrate the coming of Jesus into Jerusalem, hear these words. When Jesus had come near Bethphage and Bethany at the place called the Mount of Olives, he sent two of his disciples, saying, Go into the village ahead of you, and as you enter it, you will find tied there a colt that has never been ridden. Untie it and bring it here, and if anyone asks you why are you untying it, just say this, The Lord needs it. So those who were sent departed and found it as he had told them. As they were untying the colt, its owners asked them, Why are you untying the colt? And they said, The Lord needs it. Then they brought it to Jesus, and after throwing their cloaks on the colt, they set Jesus upon it. As he rode along, people kept spreading their cloaks on the road. As he was now approaching the path down from the Mount of Olives, the whole multitude of the disciples began to praise God joyfully with a loud voice, for all the deeds of power that they had seen, saying, Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest heaven. Some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to him, Teacher, order your disciples to stop. He answered, I tell you, if these were silent, the stones would shout out. As you heard on that first Palm Sunday, it was not quiet. And so uh, we are going to begin with some energy and noise as we prepare to sing uh, our opening hymn and to wave our palms and have our procession. And so, uh, but I need to get some Hosanna shouts. So can, can I hear a Hosanna on the count of three? One, two, three. Hosanna. And now that was good practice. Now our louder one. One, two, three. Hosanna. There we go. Let's stand together and sing as we are able. Sunday. 
As we're standing, I want you to turn to your neighbor and greet them in the spirit and love of Christ with a high five, an elbow bump, or whatever. And the kids can come on down for Time with Carl. Well, as you're taking your seats, I'll invite any of our kids that are here. We've got, got a few of them down here now. Oh, here come a couple more. All right. Good morning. Well, okay, this is an easy, easy quiz. What Sunday is it? Palm Sunday, exactly. This is the day that the crowd celebrated Jesus coming into Jerusalem for what would be uh, his last week before Easter and the resurrection and all of that good news and the story that we're going to tell next Sunday. But when they came in, to, when Jesus came into the town, were the people excited? They were. That's why they were waving palm branches. In their day, that's, that was kind of what it was. If somebody important came into town or someone exciting, they would grab palm branches and wave those. But I, I always like to think, now, what would we do if we were really excited? And, uh, you know, baseball started this week. Any baseball fans? Yeah, all right, a few. You're glad they, the baseball is back, that's right. Um, so I remember going to the stadium a few years back, and when the teams um, do something really good, people get excited and they cheer, right? And they clap. Well, we went to this game one time, and they had these really cool things that they handed out to let, let the team know that you were excited. And when I think of Palm Sunday, I always think of these things. Have you ever seen these? Yeah, these are called uh, thunder sticks or boom sticks or something like that, but they make this noise. And, and that's what people will do at the game if the team does something they're really excited about. But, you know, these are only a couple. Seems like we need a few more of them. So why don't I get, the, you know, we had palms out there, but I got, I got a bunch here. So why don't, uh, why don't you each grab two? Yeah, oh, it's like you know how to use these already. There we go. All right, let's see. Now, let's pretend Jesus has just come into town. They are excited about him, and, and this is super great. What do we do? One, two, three. There we go. Now, can you imagine, like, a whole group of people doing that? We probably should hand, there we go, some up there by the microphone. That'll be really good. Um, because we used to live, our, we, we had a house, we used to live over in Anaheim by Anaheim Stadium, and uh, I remember one time we could hear these at our house from all the people. So the people were excited, they shouted Hosanna, which meant they were so happy that Jesus was there. So we're going to do this on the count of three, and we're going to have them shout Hosanna, just to remind ourselves how excited they were that Jesus had come. Ready? One, two, three. Hosanna! 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 Woo! Amen. Now, the great news is you get to keep these. And you can bring them to Sunday school with you. Or maybe Miss Karen will collect them at the door and then you can just take them home and use them for fun. But um, I just want you to know how excited they were that Jesus had come. And yes, exciting for your parents. And I like how you picked ones that match your shirt. That's very good. Very good. I like that. Um, so let's have a prayer, and then we'll go to Sunday school. God, we are excited that you are a part of our lives. We're excited that you have given us Jesus and this good news that he is with us, not only on that first Palm Sunday, not only on that first Easter, but with us each and every day because you love us. Be with our kids as they go to Sunday school. In your name, amen. All right, so we'll let you follow there. I, here, take this bucket with you, and then if she wants to collect them in the bucket until the end, then you, you she think won't she be might mad want at to? me tomorrow. I think, so. I think she might want to. I, I would like you to be that excited about all the things we have going on in the life of our church, too. So... I know you got about 15 handouts when you came in, so we're going to walk through those together. I'll let you get them all out. It's okay. It's just fine. 
The first one is this one, which um, has a very, on the very front thing, it says connect. And if you would like to know more about this family of faith, about this church, about ways to be involved, or about what's going on, or want to be on our e-newsletter, that's where you do it. There's a little QR code. You can scan that with your smartphone, and it'll bring up a website, and you just fill that out. Pretty easy. We promise we won't send you anything crazy. Um, but we will send you information about Good Friday. This is the next handout you have. You have a little Good Friday thing here on the front and on the back, Easter Sunday. I don't need to tell you, but you can see 7 o'clock on Friday right here, we will have a Good Friday service, and the choir will also offer up uh, for a requiem as the musical offering for that evening. On the back, Easter Sunday, which will be next Sunday. Actually, yeah, I have to say, Carl and I were just remarking this morning that it seems like Easter sort of snuck up on us. Um, even though we had these six weeks of Lent, apparently Easter is, in fact, next week. Yeah. So um, it's not really news, but there we go. It is happening next week, 10 o'clock, service in here, 11.30, egg hunt on the lawn. And now that you already have committed all that information to memory, take this and give it to a friend and say, hey, would you like to come with me to our church? We're going to have this 10 o'clock Easter service. Here's a little bit more information. Uh, and they can also be in contact with us there. So this is our last week of uh, our bookmarks. We are reading through the Gospels on the back. It has all of the Gospel readings for this final week of Lent. Um, and you can finish up your Gospel readings there. I am told not to talk about this one, um, so I won't, but you'll get that one later because it's a special announcement. And then the last thing I have for you this morning is this is your final Sunday to dedicate um, Easter flowers in honor or in memory of someone. You can do that on this sheet. If you need assistance, find me after the service and we'll get you hooked up with all that stuff. And now that you have gone through all of these pieces of paper, take them home with you, hand out the Easter one to a friend and say, come with us. And um, we will see you here on Friday evening for Good Friday and then on Sunday for Easter Sunday. And now we're going to stand and sing together. Beautiful you are 
Just to know that you are near is enough. God of heaven, come down, heaven, come down. Oh, sing a song of hope, sing along. God of heaven, come down, heaven, come down. Just to know. Seated. You also might recognize our um, guest percussionist this morning. You may have seen him around. So we're really grateful to Carl for joining the band this morning. Thank you for letting me join you. I said last week um, when you were uh, gone that it, it was like I was running around doing everything, all of the things. Little did you know. And little did I know that I'd be running around this week, but, uh, but it's all good, so... Uh, we're going to take time to be in prayer this morning and uh, to just take this moment that we do each week as we come into this place in worship, uh, as we come here to be in God's presence, to remind ourselves of God's presence. We're always in God's presence, but we come here for that reminder. And so uh, let's just take a moment to be still, to know that God is with us, and to be in prayer together. Lord, Jesus, you have set your face towards Jerusalem. As we come into this holy week, as we, as we remember that the crowds were excited as you came in, as we remember that they had heard all of the things that you had been doing over those three years, you had healed, you had fed people, you had shown them a new understanding of God one that didn't end at just following rules and trying to be perfect and good enough, but one that said God meets us right where we are, that God's love is for everyone, and that you came and shared a message that said not only is God's love for all those who thought they were a part of God's love, but, but even those who thought that they were beyond God's love for those on the outer edges, for those on the margins, as Luke said, for the, for the tax collectors and sinners, for the people that others wanted to have nothing to do with, for the lepers, as we heard about last week, for those that were outcast from society, for the least and the last and the lost. Because in Luke's gospel, in that 15th chapter, you remind us that you have a heart for the lost. That in fact, in that story of the prodigal son, that even if a son took everything and squandered it all and wasted everything and brought shame and dishonor, that if that son came home, you would run to him. If that daughter comes home, you would run to them and embrace them before they even had a moment to ask for forgiveness, your arms were around them. God, we don't understand this kind of love, but we are so grateful that, that we know that it is here. And that even as those crowds that celebrated your entry into Jerusalem in just a few short days would turn on your son, would shout, crucify him instead of Hosanna. That you didn't stop your plan, you didn't stop your hope, but you, you had Jesus move forward as the world threw its worst at him and he was put in the grave. We know that the good news is that because of your love and your love for us, he rose on that third day. Grateful isn't even enough to express how good that news is for us, but we are grateful for your mercy and your love. And God, we ask that you hear us now. 
As we, in our, each of our days, try to follow Jesus, but we simply follow him in the words that he taught us to pray. As we say together, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. And give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Before we sing, I'm going to ask my wife, could you go run and get the pastor's Bible that he might need for the sermon? It's, yeah, it's in my office. Oh, she's got a key. There you go. Real behind the scenes, what's happening, so... Today's scripture reading comes from Luke chapter 19, verses 1 through 10. He entered Jericho and was passing through it. A man was there named Zacchaeus. 
He was the chief tax collector and was rich. He was trying to see who Jesus was, but on account of the crowd, he could not, because he was short in stature. So he ran ahead and climbed a sycamore tree to see him, because he was going to pass that way. When Jesus came to the place, he looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, hurry and come down, for I must stay at your house today. So he hurried down and was happy to welcome him. All who saw it began to grumble and said, he has gone to be the guest of the one who is a sinner. Zacchaeus stood there and said to the Lord, look, half of my possessions, Lord, I will give to the poor. And if I have defrauded anyone of anything, I will pay back four times as much. Then Jesus said to him, today salvation has come to this house because he too is a son of Abraham. For the son of man came to seek out and to save the lost. May God add a blessing to the reading, hearing, and understanding of the scriptures. I, uh, I just choked on my water, but you know, if you cough these days, we kind of have to explain that. So, um, all right. Thank you, Kristen. Let's, uh, let's be in prayer. God, thank you for sharing this word with Luke that that he wrote in the gospel to tell us the kind of person that Jesus was and is and who, who he loved. Allow us to hear your spirit speak to us in these words this morning. Amen. Okay, so if I said to you this morning that tomorrow it is imperative that you renew your driver's license and there is no chance to make an appointment at the DMV, how many of you are going to be happy? Yeah. How many of you are going to set aside your entire day tomorrow, right, to figure this out because you've got to get your license? Well, thanks to Facebook you know, we get reminded of, oh, I forgot that happened this many years ago. And I had a reminder pop up uh, Friday, Friday or Saturday. Um, Let's see, did we test this again? There we go. So this was my reminder. Very exciting picture that I posted. On April 7th, 2016, and I know you can read those words, but I'll just read them for you. It says, in and out of the DMV in eight minutes. I know. It pays to get there at 6.30 a.m. and be number two in line. (laughs) But six minutes. And then through the magic of Facebook, there was another similar post, because for some reason the year before, I had to go. It's not going back. Can you go to the next one for me? Are we frozen? There we go. August 18th, 2015, evidently I had messed up twice in that year. Uh, Arrive at the DMV an hour and a half before they open, drink your coffee, catch up on emails, and a crossword, walk through the doors when they open and renew your license in nine minutes. Easy. Who says you need an appointment, right? (laughs) Amen. Um, It is possible to do. Uh, And I actually like an early morning person, so uh, I would go and I would just sit in the car, and I would wait. I didn't, actually wasn't first in line, because I would wait until I, I saw the first person walk up, and then I would go out and get second or third in line. But you literally can walk in and get anything done you need to get done when you get there early enough. Life and those things that are important in life usually take some effort and some willingness to change. I mean, we, we have lots of examples of these. I know, uh, I, I know I have some back issues, but I also know that if I stretch every day and if I drink enough water and do all of these things, no problems, right? We know those things are there. But change takes effort. You have to really want to change, and it can make all the difference in the world. This morning is our final moment with Jesus. We have journeyed for six weeks on moments with Jesus, moments that people had that changed 
who they are. Uh, we have our journey on the back wall back there, but we, we were with Mary and Martha as they learned to listen to God. Uh, we were with the disciples as they learned to trust and to be willing to step out. I, I didn't write all this down, so now I'm going to have to remember all of my sermons. Uh, let's see. Uh, receiving was... Which one was receiving? Pete, no, 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 no. Well, you know what? They were all good moments that we had. That's the thing. As soon as I, I was fine, I was going, and then I thought in my head, I thought, oh, you didn't write this down, and you've committed to that. You're entrusting yourself. And then I realized, uh-oh, I'm not going to remember it. But gratitude was the ten lepers and the one that came back. Um, and and we, we've had all of these moments. So salvation this week, we're talking about that in the story of Zacchaeus. And what we're going to find out is that it wasn't easy for that change to happen, and that it took effort, and that he really had to want to change. But it made all the difference in that moment with Jesus. So um, Jesus is making his final approach to Jerusalem for what would be the last week. Now, in Luke's gospel, which we've spent a lot of time in, it's in chapter 9 that it says he set his face towards Jerusalem. And most of his ministry has taken place up here in the region of Galilee that's circled in red around uh, the Sea of Galilee. He's been teaching and doing all of those things. Uh, last week, he made it down to the border of Samaria and Galilee, and that's where he encountered the ten lepers. He is making his way to Jerusalem. In this week's story, he gets to Jericho, and we're going to see what happens in Jericho. And then he goes up to Jerusalem. Now, I, I realized w w after my first trip uh, to Israel, I realized I have been sort of, I, I guess the term would be north-centric my entire life, because for, for me, when you're going south, you're going down. And I, it always puzzled me, why do they say going up to Jerusalem? But when you have been to Jericho or the Dead Sea, the, the lowest place on earth, which those, those places are, are right next to each other, and you go to Jerusalem, you realize, oh, you are going up. You literally are going up a hill. The climate changes. Um, in fact, one time I left Jerusalem, it was snowing in Jerusalem, and we got down to the Dead Sea, and it was dry and warm. So Jesus is going up to a new experience and a new place. This week's story of Zacchaeus actually takes place right before Palm Sunday in Luke's gospel. It happens just after that. And uh, Zacchaeus, Zacchaeus has this unique experience. And I learned some things about it that I had not learned in the past, because we can always learn new things. And so I want to take us through a few of these things to maybe help you hear the story of Zacchaeus in a new way. So um, verse 1, Jesus entered Jericho and was passing through it. I think Luke was very intentional about saying it that way, because Jesus is just passing through Jericho. He's not going to stay in Jericho. He's on his way to Jerusalem. And this is going to become important later in the story. Now, he gets to the edge of the city, and he heals a blind man there at the start. And so a crowd now gathers. So there's a crowd of, of uh, I don't know if they call them Jerichoans, but people from Jericho, are, are with Jesus, and they're walking with him through the town as he's passing through on the way. It is not quiet. Everybody is there in the town. And then Luke goes to verse 2. A man was there named Zacchaeus. He was a chief tax collector and was rich. Oh, there's so much in that sentence. We learn so much about Zacchaeus. We learn he was a tax collector. Remember in Luke's gospel a couple times now, particularly in Luke 15, um, oh, that was the receive one, the, the lost sheep and the lost son and all of those, those stories. We learn that Jesus came to seek out and save the lost. And at the start of that chapter, the Pharisees are upset with Jesus because he eats with tax collectors and sinners. Um, so being a sinner, not good in Jesus' day for a first century Jew, 
But tax collectors had their own category of not so good. And so um, Zacchaeus, as Luke tells us, is a tax collector on top of being a sinner. I mean, he's a sinner because he's a tax collector. Now, why? You may have heard this before. If you've been in church long enough, you probably know these things. But let me just share, just in case you haven't heard the full story, why were these tax collectors so hated? I mean, I know this is one of those years where Good Friday lands on tax day. You know, IRS, we, there's all sorts of jokes we can do. We're not really fond of them. But this is not that kind of tax collector. You know, the IRS are simply doing what they're supposed to do, and, and we can debate that later. But a tax collector in Jesus' day, something completely different. So remember the time, first century um, uh, Israel, first century Palestine there, um, and they are under Roman oppression. So the Roman Empire is, uh, is violently, if you will, controlling everything that is happening there, forcefully, cruelly, and with a heavy hand. And when you're an empire, you also need to pay for that empire. And how do you pay for that empire? Well, you collect taxes. So Rome collected taxes. And each town, each area, there was a tax. But it wasn't Roman citizens who collected the tax. They went to the town and found somebody within the town and sold them a contract. They're saying, we're going to give you the right to collect the tax. And I'll tell you what, you pay for this right to collect the tax, Rome gets a little more money, you can charge whatever you want, and we are going to enforce that they have to pay it. So if, you know, the tax is, is uh, five shekels, you can charge them ten shekels, and we're going to make sure that they pay that, and you make a little extra profit. Um, and people were required to pay it. And Zacchaeus was not only a tax collector, but Luke tells us he was a ch chief tax collector. That means he had kind of a, a group of tax collectors under him, so he was making even more off of that. So you have Zacchaeus, a first century Jewish man living in Jericho who is collecting taxes from his neighbors. He was probably rich enough to begin with to be able to, to purchase this contract. But he's collecting taxes and, and, and overcharging people for his own profit. It would be as if the city of San Clemente suddenly decided, hey, uh, we got to get more tax revenue, so we are gonna, we're going to collect a tax at churches every time somebody drives into a church parking lot. Um, but, you know, we don't have enough money to hire extra staff, so I got it. Here's what we'll do. We'll go to the church, and we'll get one of their church members to pay us for the right to collect the $5 tax. So they would go and find the nicest person in the church, someone like Pat Brashear back here, very nice guy right? And Pat pays for it, and then he goes down to the front entrance there at, at Calle Frontera, and every time you come in, you have to give him $10. But you're like, you know the city tax is only $5. So where's the extra $5 going? Of course, it's going into the offering plate, because that's the kind of guy. No, it's not. No, Pat's keeping it for himself. And, and then he comes in to worship with us, right? Now, he's going to be your favorite guy, especially when you see he's driving a new car, and going on some great vacations. And, and one of the nicest guys I know, but how long is it gonna take before you're starting to be frustrated with this person who is taking from you? This is Zacchaeus, and people are not happy with him. It is not a safe place for him to be. He's not gonna be their favorite person. And Luke tells us he's rich. That means he was doing it well means he was doing it well. But then, Luke tells us something else about him. Verse 3, he was trying to see who Jesus was, but on account of the crowd, he could not because he was short in stature. This is just a side note. It has nothing to do with it, but when I took my Greek class in seminary, our professor pointed out that the way that that sentence is structured you really do not know whether short is describing Zacchaeus or Jesus. Like Zacchaeus had to climb a tree because Jesus was so short and he couldn't see him over the crowd, or Zacchaeus was short. And I know that ruins the VBS song. <laughs> so we're just going to keep Zacchaeus the short one. It's, it's okay. But um, what does it say? It says Zacchaeus 
wants to see Jesus. Why would he want to see Jesus? Well, this is the guy that, that he's heard eats with tax collectors and sinners. I mean, Zacchaeus must have been lonely in this town. He must have felt outcast. And this is a guy coming in that, that actually he's heard, well, he eats with tax collectors. He's come for them. And so Zacchaeus wants to see him. Now, in the ancient Near East, a, 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 a wealthy person, the crowd would have moved for him because he had honor and wealth. But this crowd clearly is not going to move for him, and he knows that. This crowd is probably going to go for him if he is there. And so um, he goes, and Luke tells us something very specific. Verse 4, so Zacchaeus ran ahead and climbed a sycamore tree to see him because he was going to pass that way. Two things that I didn't realize in that. Well, first, uh, the first one I had heard before. Zacchaeus runs. And I said this when we talked about the prodigal son, because the father and the prodigal son runs to the son. But uh, fathers, men in those days, did not run. That was a, it was a shameful thing for them to do. You don't, you don't run, and it's, we'd, we'd have to look at their whole cultural context. But, but wealthy men with status do not run. And Luke is, is clear to tell us he ran, just like the, the father and the prodigal son. And then he climbed what kind of tree? Sycamore tree. Why do we want to know it's a sycamore tree? Do we care? Actually, we would have in those days. Because you would have known, of course, that in the Mishnah, the uh, Jewish extra law book that they have, it clearly states that a tree may not be grown within a distance of 25 cubits from the town or 50 cubits if it's a carob or sycamore tree. This specific tree had to be grown at least 75 feet away from the town. So what does this tell us? This story is not happening in the midst of Jericho. It's happening on the other side of the town that Jesus is passing through, at least 75 feet away. What has Zacchaeus done? He's run away from the crowd to stay out of their view. He's climbed up into a thick tree, and he's just hoping to catch a glimpse of Jesus. And Jesus could have walked on by but he stops, and he sees Zacchaeus. I'm sure the crowd saw him too, but he, he sees him, and he says, Zacchaeus, hurry and come down, for I am going to your house today. Now, in a movie, this would be where the needle scratch on a record happens, that sound that says, whoa, stop everything. Because this crowd knew Jesus was passing through. He'd already passed through the town. He's not staying in the town. He gets to the outside. He says, Zacchaeus, I'm staying at your house. We're going back in. And they are shocked beyond belief. This is the kind of person that Jesus is going to stay with. Jesus has now changed his plans in order to show, I am here to be with you, Zacchaeus. And the people grumbled. They grumbled. If you remember that great word from a few weeks ago, diagongazo, to grumble, right? That is, that is to, to be murmuring, and they're going, what is this Jesus doing? Who is this? This guy is crazy. We're really angry. And what's happened now? The anger they had towards Zacchaeus has been transferred onto Jesus. Now they're mad at Jesus because he's gone to be the guest of one who is a sinner. Zacchaeus is overwhelmed. This, if we're reading it in the whole context of reading Luke, and we know that just four short chapters earlier, Jesus told this story about a man who had two sons, and the one son went away and, and squandered everything, and yet when he came back home, the man ran to him. Like, but that was just a story. This is that story put in real life. This is that story made real. Jesus is saying, look, I'm going to be with this person, because I've come to seek and to save everybody, including the lost. And it's there that a change happens, that salvation, if you will, enters in. Because Zacchaeus stood there and said to the Lord, look, half of my possessions, Lord, I will give to the poor. 
And if I defrauded anyone of anything, I will pay back four times as much. And Jesus then says to him, Today salvation has come to this house, because he too is a son of Abraham. For the Son of Man has come to seek out and save the lost. Zacchaeus desperately wanted change to happen. And it was not an easy change. He had to risk. He, he had to say, I want things to be different. And then very clearly in this moment, Zacchaeus is like overcome by the fact that Jesus would go and be in his house, that he says, I'll give it all back. I'll give, I don't want it anymore. In fact, I'll pay back and I'll take from the prophets and give them back four times, which it, it's an exaggeration, but... What he's saying is, I'm going to make this right. Salvation has come to this house after Zacchaeus says that because Jesus realizes he wants that big change. And he's willing to do everything to make that difference. Now, salvation. A lot of times salvation gets narrowed down to a moment. Um, sometimes you can ask people, when, when were you saved? And they can tell you a moment, a day, a time. In the United Methodist uh, way, in the Wesleyan way of salvation of, of, of our founder, John Wesley, I, I, th I think he saw salvation as less of a moment and more of the start of a journey. Um, so I, I'm going to do just a little brief um, United Methodist understanding of salvation. And and, you know, we United Methodists, like committees, if, if things can be easy, we like to make them complicated um, a lot of times. And so uh, we don't just have one amazing grace. Wesley had three different kinds of graces that he talked about. But we have prevenient grace. This is the forgiveness of God that is in your lives at this moment because of what Jesus did on that first Easter. You are forgiven. So last week we had a baptism in here, and, and I baptized uh, that, that little baby Logan. And, and, you know, he can't say yes to Jesus. He, he, can't, he can't do anything like that. But we baptize him because we recognize that the provenient grace of God is at work within him already. That voice whispering, you are loved. You are my beloved. You are forgiven. All of those things. And then as we go through life and we start to, we hear the good news of Jesus, we start to hear that. Our spirit starts to, to say that. The, the way I always describe this, um, and I'll describe this this way over the years many times, but we don't really have shopping malls anymore. So this, I may have to get a new uh, a new image, but when you used to go to the shopping mall, the indoor shopping mall, and you'd be walking around, you remember they had that Muzak playing, which was like, you know, Beatles tunes with a symphony orchestra playing it or something, and you'd be walking around, you ignore it all the time. It's always there, but you ignore it until you're like standing there at a place, and then suddenly you're like, wait a minute, is, is, is that, is that, she, she loves me, yeah, yeah, yeah? Yeah, and you recognize the song, and then suddenly you can hear it crystal clear. It's been there the whole time, but suddenly you hear it. Provenient grace is the same way. It's that grace of God. God wait, I'm forgiven? I'm, I'm loved? God loves me? And then suddenly we hear that. And in that moment that we hear that and we decide we want to say yes to that, then, then we have justifying grace, as Wesley called it. This is that we are put into a right relationship with God. Really, we recognize that relationship with God, and it changes who we are. You know, so, so Zacchaeus recognized. He said, yes, he came down, and he was like, oh, I'm forgiven. And then really the most important part of salvation, I think, uh, in Wesley's understanding was sanctifying grace. And, and this is the part that isn't just a moment is the ongoing for the rest of our lives. Sanctifying, to make holy, to change. We, from that moment of saying yes, when we are justified and made right with God, the rest of our lives is God working on us, drawing us closer. We don't go back to the other side. We keep moving forward. 
And I didn't put it up here, but I, I had a professor that said, and as you're in that sanctifying process, sometimes you'll spin off to the side of the road, you'll see something shiny, but, but God always directs us back onto that road. We don't go backwards, we're moving forwards. So this story of salvation is the beginning of the rest of the life of Zacchaeus. It's it's the beginning of a whole new way. I don't, we don't know how it turns out. It's, it's one of these days when I write, you know, one of the millions of books that are in my head. The one that I would love to write is, okay, what happened to these people after? We only know one moment of Zacchaeus. What happens after? How was he changed? But he is on that road of salvation, moving forward, and he learns to love. He learns to not only be generous and make right and, and make right what he had wronged, but but hopefully he learns to be generous and to continue to give and to continue to love and to continue to know that there is no one outside of God's love. This is the good news of salvation. It's the good news of the Zacchaeus story, that if, if Jesus came for Zacchaeus, a chief tax collector who was rich, then he's come for each one of us, and that is good news. Amen. So, um, uh, Emily talked about that handout, which I don't have it. Is it up here? Uh, for Rise Against Hunger. Uh, we talked about this uh, last week, and um, this is an organization that we're going to work with on May 1st. This is going to be a day where you can come to church and make a hands-on difference um, feeding people. And you can be this tall or this tall, uh, you can be this old, or you add the numbers to the end. Everybody can do this. And what we're going to be doing with Rise Against Hunger is packaging meals. Um, and you're going to see it in just a minute on the video. But, but we're going to make an assembly line. They're going to bring all the stuff, and we're going to package high-protein, high-multinutrient meals that are freeze-dried, that are going to go from our hands into a box, and then the next hands that open them will be the people who are going to eat that meal that are in desperate need of food. And um, there are, I'm banking there's going to be 50 to 70 of us doing that. And with 50 to 70 of us in an hour, we can make 12,000 meals. Yeah, wow, isn't that uh, 12,000 meals? of people who will literally eat. So I, I want to show, um, uh, show you a video that just gives you a little background on them. And uh, today we're going to start our collection process for that. But let's uh, see, are we ready with the video up there? Let's uh, go ahead and take a look at what happens. to see how a Rise Against Hunger meal makes it into the hands of those who need it most. Welcome to one of Rise Against Hunger's school feeding programs located in Lusaka, Zambia, where over 40 children gather to learn and share a lunch. For many of these children, this will be their only meal of the day. These meals do more than just nourish the body. They allow the students to focus, advance their education, and most importantly, provide hope for a brighter future. Every day, Rise Against Hunger meals are served around the globe in medical clinics, vocational training programs, elder care facilities, and schools just like this. Each meal is a moment to celebrate. It's a step on the path to zero hunger. Let's take a look at how each of these moments is made possible. It all begins when a group gathers to host and take part in a meal packaging event. Before the big day, raw ingredients are ordered, prepped and loaded onto Rise Against Hunger trucks to be delivered. When the event is set up, volunteers begin filing in, donning gloves and hairnets and getting settled at their stations, knowing with confidence that alongside their friends, family and members of the community, they are going to be changing lives with each meal they package. At the conclusion of a meal packaging event, these pallets are sent to our on-the-ground partners via shipping containers. 
After reaching the destination port, containers are unloaded and pallets of meals are distributed to our impact partners. The meals are prepared in bulk to feed the children at the school. The effect of these meals is community-wide. The hands at our meal packaging events are the last ones to touch the meals before they are unboxed and served to those children and families who need them the most. Together, we can create a world where hunger doesn't exist. Your impact starts with a meal. Have you joined the It Starts With a Meal movement yet? Visit riseagainsthunger.org start to learn more. You get to wear a hairnet. That, is, you're gonna, it, that makes everybody look good. So, um, so we're going to do that on May 1st, and we are going to package 12,000 or more meals. Um, our order of food has gone in, and we are set to do that. As I shared last week, um, the cost of each of those meals is 35 cents. Uh, but what I did was I went through, I said, you know what, if, if someone's going to eat two meals a day, seven days in the week, it's about $5 to feed a person for a week with one of these meals, about $5. And so on this, uh, on this handout, we have how many people would you like to feed? Uh, one at $5, 10 at 50, 50 at 250, 100 at 500, or you put in the number. Um, because we want to we wanna feed people. We want to do this concrete act to, to, to be able to, to help those that are in need. And so there's a QR code down there that you can do it directly through there. However, following worship, we are going to have a couple of folks out there with a square, one, one, yeah, two folks with a square reader. So if you want to swipe your card and pay that way, they will gladly help feed someone uh, for, for the week. So we want to give you that opportunity. I'm going to uh, pray for this, and then we're going to stand and sing our doxology. So uh, let's be in prayer. God, we're grateful that there are things that we can do that make a difference. Um, we pray for the people that are going to get these 12,000 meals that will come from this church. Uh, we pray for all those who are hungry today. We pray for those who are in need. And out of the blessings that you have given to us, we want to give back. Allow us to be a difference in these people's lives that continues then to make a difference in our lives as we live the good news of Jesus Christ. Amen. So let's stand together as we're able, and we will sing uh, the doxology, our, our song of thanksgiving and grace.
Well, again, we, uh, we are glad that you are here today. We look forward to seeing you on Easter Sunday. We are going to have all sorts of special stuff on Easter Sunday. I think we've got brass coming in and choir and all sorts of good stuff. So um, uh, we welcome you back on Easter Sunday. And now go, knowing that you are loved by God, that Jesus has come into our lives to say, hey, I'm coming to your house today. And that's good news. Amen.